In the Court of Appeal, Civil Division, before the Master of the Rolls, Lord Justice Moylan and Lord Justice Arnold, Tuesday the 23rd of March 2020, in the matter of HSBC Bank PLC, the Stanford International Bank Limited, case numbers A3-2020-1629, A3-2020-1631, Good. Before we start, uh, can I just uh, make a few um, short points? First, um, this is a formal court hearing, notwithstanding that it is uh, conducted remotely, and um, I hope and I'm confident that all parties attending will um, behave as they would if they were in court. It would be uh, best if everybody kept their um, microphones on mute, unless they are talking, and we'll take two breaks for about five or six minutes um, in the morning, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and if council can um, decide when that's appropriate and suggest it, uh, that will be the easiest way. Um, at noon this morning, if we're sitting, which I expect we will, we will observe a minute's silence in memory of the victims of the and um, I think that's all I need to say because the parties, I think, have agreed to running order. And I know that we're going to start with Ms. Robertson on loss. So over to you. Thank you, my lord. I appear in this matter for HSBC with Ms. Hutton and Mr. Langley. Uh, Mr. Fenwick QC appears with Mr. Demestri QC and Mr. Mockbusset. Um, on our last outing before Mr. Justice Nuji on the 31st of July 2020, we ended up with a score draw. Um, this time, my lord, we're hoping for a clean sweep. Um, your lordship will have seen that this matter is due to go to a five-week trial in October of this year, substantial cost. I I'm told, in fact, that the estimate for HSBC has increased beyond the figures that I think, think we quoted in our skeleton and is now at least some seven million. That's on our side alone, and one assumes something comparable for SIB. Now, if HSBC is successful in its appeal on the loss point, and the decision below is upheld as regards dishonest assistance, the practical consequence of that would be that those costs on either side would be incurred in debating whether HSBC was or was not at fault in terms of the Prince Care duty in making a payment of some $3 million, about £2.4 million, pounds, to the English Cricket Board. So that would be the only damages claim that would survive. Can, I just, ask you, can I just ask you, Ms. Robertson, I mean, I understand all that. Um, the, the, the claim to the ECB, the claim for the payment to the ECB is that small claim of two and a half million, but there is a discrepancy between 118.5 million and 80 million. How is that accounted for? Well, my Lord, that relates to the difference between, on the one hand, the 80 million being the balance in the account as at the 1st of August 2008, when SIP says the account should have been frozen, 118 million, sorry, 118.5 5 million is the outflow from the account between that date and the 17th of February 2009. Or sorry, I think it may be the 18th of February anyway, the date when um, following Mr. Stanford having been charged by the SEC, the bank then froze the account. So that's the outflow and the fact that there's more of an outflow than there was a balance in the account at the time of 1st of August 2008 relates to the fact that some money would have flowed into the accounts in that interim period. Right, and how, so, so your point that all that will be left is the 2.5 million, is, is that on the basis that the whole of the 116 million was paid out to CD holders? Um, my Lord, it comes in two parts. It does all end up with CD holders. So and, the, and the, I understand so, that. The exactly. Um, the no loss point, therefore, in terms of discharge of a debt, applies to the whole lot. However, there's a separate no loss point, my Lord, that applies to 36 million of the outflow, because that 36 million went to Toronto Dominion, another account of SIBS. And so we have the even simpler point on that, that transferring money to another account of SIBS did not cause that money to be lost to SIB. Can I just ask why we're dealing with that? What was the balance on the accounts as of February 2000 and you say 8? Uh, 2000, 
2009. Um, my Lord, I don't think we have that figure in the pleadings, I'm afraid to say. Um, so, so, my Lord, the, the point in terms of cost and practicality is the parties would be having the entire debate about the Quince Care claim, the entire issues that SIB raises about whether HSBC was on notice or not, but in relation to that sum of 2.4 million, because it's common ground that that, that payment to the ECB is not affected by either of our no loss points. It's, it's 2.4 million pounds or dollars. Uh, it's 2.4 million pounds. That, that, that's the conversion of what was a dollar payment in the amount of 3 million. So your lordships will have seen the factual background to this claim. We've summarised it at paragraphs 2 to 20 of our lost skeleton. Just very briefly, the investors in SIB thought they were buying certificates of deposit with impressive returns. All a house of cards collapses on the 17th of February 2009 when Mr Stanford is charged by the SEC. He is currently serving an excess of a 100-year sentence in the US for his fraud. And whereas SIB's audited financial statements had presented it as having many billions in assets and of keeping some 10% of investors' funds in cash, such that investors would have been reassured both about SIB's substance and its liquidity, all of that turned out to be a complete fiction, helped along by Mr. Stanford having bribed SIB's auditor and its regulator. Now, prior to Mr. Stanford being charged with fraud, SIB had maintained correspondent banking relationships with banks in a number of different jurisdictions, including in particular Toronto Dominion in Canada, which seems to have been its main banking relationship, and with HSBC. Now, as I say, HSBC did freeze the accounts in response to Mr. Stanford being charged. Uh, he was charged on the 17th of February 2009. And in the Quince Care claim, SIB says it should have been frozen on the 1st of August. As I say, that's when the balances were 80 million. Uh, and that would have prevented the 118.5 million leaving the accounts after that date. Now, there are rather two rather striking things about this as a Quince Care claim. And the first unusual aspect, which we've already touched on, leads to the point before this court on HSBC's appeal. That is that all of the money that went out from the accounts, is a, it, none of it is alleged to have gone into Mr. Stanford's pocket or to have been diverted into one of his other companies. It's SIB's own case that 80 million out of that 118.5 million outflow from the accounts went directly from HSBC to investors who were redeeming their CDs or as interest. The reference for that in the evidence is Jenkins, paragraph 34, page 41 of the supplementary bundle. We don't need to turn it up. And in fact, SIB has explained in its RFI response exactly how those redemption requests from investors were processed by SIB. The innocent CD investor initiates payments to themselves by making a redemption request, which the backroom people at SIB, equally innocent of involvement in the fraud, process, turn into a swift instruction to HSBC using the, the correct swift key, and HSBC then pays out direct to the investor. And for your Lordship's notes, the, the reference for that is SIB's RFI response, supplemental bundle, tab 9, paragraphs 11, 1, and 15, 7. Now, 80 million of the outflow left from HSBC directly to investors in that way. A further 36 million was transferred from HSBC to the other accounts of SIBs at Toronto Dominion. And Ms. Jenkins, in her evidence, tells us that those latter sums also ended up in the hands of CD investors. Now, the other somewhat unusual thing uh, about this story is that only Stanford himself, one other director of SIB, Mr. Davis, are alleged to have been in on the fraud, together with two individuals from other companies in the Stanford group. And one gets that from SIB's reply, paragraph 3, tab 16, page 345. So the rest of the board and everyone below that level on SIB's case were innocent. SIB's case has to be that HSBC should have questioned the payments being made out of SIB's accounts, even though none of the innocent directors and employees at SIB saw any reason to do so. 
Now, unsurprisingly, HSBC strongly contests that, but that debate, we accept, will need to be a matter for trial. So as your Lordship said, a running order has been agreed, uh, and it's for me to open our case on the no-loss point. The breach that's alleged against HSBC consists in making payments out of SIPs accounts, but the payments in question either discharged debts SIP owed or went to another account of SIPs. Our simple proposition is that on those facts, SIP has suffered no loss. Now, it's not disputed that that's the answer if the customer is solvent. The issue between us is whether the answer changes because SIP was insolvent. We say that makes no difference. Damages are to be measured at the time of breach, and in the case of those payments that went to CD investors, there's a benefit that flows directly and simultaneously from the breach in the form of the discharge of debt. As at the date of payment, those investors were entitled to payment in full. The discharge of those debts is a benefit, we say, which matches and cancels out any loss. And of course, where the money simply moves to another account of SIPs, it can't, on any view, be said to be lost to SIP. And do you rely on the Privy Council's decision where Lord Briggs makes it clear that these monies were due and there wasn't an insolvency claim in respect of them to get them back? Well, my Lord, plainly we say that's right, but that was our position even before the Privy Council decision, that these were debts that were discharged. I'll take your Lordship through how the matter developed on the pleadings. The Privy Council decision knocks down SIP's attempted defence on the basis that somehow the debts weren't discharged. It makes it clear that we were right all along about that. My Lord, what we say is the fact that SIP subsequently entered an insolvency process in Antigua is irrelevant. The nature of the Prince Care duty isn't altered by insolvency, and nor is the measure of loss. And it's important to emphasise that there's no claim here for some form of consequential loss, as might perhaps be conjured up on a different set of facts. Unlike the facts of Singularis and Daiwa, which I know the Master of Roles is familiar with, it's not alleged that HSBC actually knew SIP was insolvent, because HSBC could only have known that if it uncovered the fact that SIP's business was fraudulent. The whole thrust of the Prince Care claim is that HSBC completely failed to spot what SIP says were the warning signs in that respect. We say the fact of SIP's insolvency does not provide a justification for departing from the analysis which would otherwise apply. SIP itself is no worse off as a result of the payments which discharge liabilities of SIP. Now, in his extemporary judgment, Mr Justice Nugy described our submissions as simple and beguilingly attractive. Now, simple I can live with, but beguiling is never an adjective that a judge applies to submissions that he or she is minded to accept. He regarded our submission that SIP was no worse off as being contrary to one's instinctive and common sense reaction to the facts. Now, his reasoning was that had the accounts been frozen as at the 1st of August 2008, the balance of £80 million would have been available for distribution within the subsequent insolvency. And on that basis, not having that money was a clear loss, whereas the discharge of the debts, in his analysis, was not a matching benefit to SIP, given the depth of SIP's insolvency, which he said made it a matter of indifference to SIP whether its liabilities were reduced by that amount. He acknowledged the possibility that there might be some far lesser element of benefit to SIP to be calculated by reference to whether the distributions to creditors were increased because of the liabilities being discharged, but that would be minimal. So, Mr Justice Nugy's instinctive reaction to the problem was driven by a focus on the impact on a distribution to creditors within the liquidation. But we say that's the wrong focus. One can't, however hard one tries, dress that up as a loss to the company, and it's only to the company that any duty was owed. Now, as I've just touched on, Mr Justice Nugy... So, just to be clear, Ms Robertson, 
your submission at root is that the answer here is Salomon and Salomon. It's as old as that. Well, my lord, yes, and it's applied, as we see, on analogous facts in Nemgia, which we'll come to in due course. There's simply a countervailing benefit which cancels out the loss. And the only way to assess that on our facts is by looking at the balance sheet and the impact on the balance sheet. The distribution to the creditors is not relevant because all the cases that relate to that are concerned with very different duties that directors owe, and particularly so in the face of impending insolvency. So one has to start with the nature of the duty that's engaged here. Well, I mean, you say that it's perfectly obvious that the duty is a very narrow duty. See Mr. Justice Stain in Quince Care itself. It's a narrow duty owed to the company. See my judgment in Daiwa Bank. It's not owed to the creditors, even if the company is insolvent. And therefore, the fact that different creditors would get different amounts if the duty had not been breached is not something that gives the company a right to additional damages. And that's in a nutshell. My lord, that's in a nutshell. Therefore, I can probably shut up for the next two hours because that is indeed an encapsulation of how we're putting it. But I'm deterred. I'm not trying to deter you, but what I am trying to test is the stages in that argument. So you do need to look at the nature of the duty. You need to look at the scope of the duty that you're dealing with. And you need to try and show, if you can, it seems to me, that the judge's concern, namely that creditors would be treated differently in an insolvent situation, which obviously they would be, is not a concern. So you have to deal with West Mercia and how far West Mercia takes Mr. Fenwick. Indeed, my lord. I mean, I'm just encouraging you really to focus on the really difficult points in the case rather than the easy ones. My lord, I'm not hoping to evade the difficult point. And in fact, I was just about to move on to West Mercia, just in terms of foreshadowing where we go with it, because I think there's a bit to do first. As your lordships have diverted to, Mr. Justice Nugent, you flagged the possibility that one might apply here an equivalent to what's known as the West Mercia proviso. And below, as before your lordship, SIB relied on West Mercia, among a number of other cases related to directors' misfeasance. Now, what we say is none of those cases support the proposition that SIB itself has suffered a loss. What the West Mercia proviso is concerned with is when you're ordering discretionary relief against a director to formulate that relief in such a way that you put the distribution to creditors back to what it would have been in the absence of the misfeasance. And the secret to all of this lies in analyzing not just what the quince care duty is, lords, but also what the duty is owed by directors and how that differs. And in short, the directors do owe a duty in relation to the pot of assets and the interests of creditors in that pot of assets. And that explains the different outcome in the cases that are concerned with directors' misfeasance. And it explains why, whether the company has suffered a loss, is simply not a relevant inquiry in that context. So what we say, my lord, is that the reference to West Mercia in Mr. Justice Nugent's judgment gives the game away because it reveals his focus has shifted to the financial impact on creditors and the distribution and not the impact on SIB itself, which is where the focus needs to be. Now, it's appropriate to conflate the interests of the company and those of the creditors when you're dealing with a claim against a director for misfeasance committed in the face of impending insolvency. But we say for the purposes of the quince care claim, one must focus rigorously on whether SIB itself has suffered a loss that stands in damages, and it hasn't. We say there's no justification for entangling a common law damages claim for breach of the quince care duty and the kinds of considerations, multifactorial considerations, that are relevant when you're determining 
whether a discretionary remedy should be granted as against a defaulting director. And that is what SID is seeking to do in its submissions. Because in stark contrast to the Prince Care duty, the duties of directors do alter fundamentally once insolvency is in view. And the remedies available against them as defaulting fiduciaries are directed to reconstituting the trust fund and rectifying any impact that breaches of that very different duty have had on a pari passu distribution within an insolvency process. Wouldn't it be said against you that this is all very unjust? Because one can envisage, well, I mean, effectively, the creditors that got their money back were preferred. And everybody else, the 5 billion creditors, instead of getting, let's say, 10p, the figures don't matter, but let's say instead of getting 10p in the pound, get 8p in the pound. And they have no remedy for that under this approach to the law. Well, my lord, yes. But that follows from the fact that no duty is owed to them. The law does sometimes produce what look like harsh results when a party doesn't owe a duty of care to the party who experiences loss. This is not unique in that respect. The simple fact is that those who got their money out in time were entitled at that point in time to receive their full contractual amount. And they did. And that discharged a liability on SIB's balance sheet. It was a benefit to SIB, whatever the impact down the line in terms of distribution of assets to creditors, a matter in respect of which HSBC owes no duty. Its only duty is to SIB. I mean, in theory, there could be a claim for losses caused by not having frozen the accounts separate from payment to people who were entitled to receive the money. But they haven't formulated any such claim, have they? No, my lord, they haven't. I was going to come to that on the pleadings. And my lord, it's perhaps worth just noting that there are proceedings on foot. I don't know if your lordships have picked this up. In the United States, against a host of banks who were involved with SIB, including Toronto Dominion and including HSBC, those are being brought by a committee of investors. And those are, of course, being brought under US law. So that's a whole other show that's going on on the other side of the Atlantic. And they either will or won't have success in their claims. But we're concerned with the claim that SIB brings here for breach of a quince care duty against HSBC. And we say that effectively SIB is trying to align that with the very different duties owed by directors in order to arrive at a prohibited result, which is effectively to treat HSBC as if it owed a duty to the creditors, who are the only people who are adversely affected in this story. And it's accepted, as I say, that the correct answer would be that there's no loss if SIB were solvent. Our proposition is that SIB's insolvency does not provide it with an escape route from that conclusion. Now, to set the stage, I was planning to go next to the pleadings on loss, then to how the quince care duty has been defined, then to the decision in NEMGIA, which we say supports our position. Then I'll turn to the judgment, followed by the cases on which SIB relies. So to go to the pleadings, my lord, and set the stage, we need to look just at a few paragraphs. First of all, in the particulars of claim, tab 14 of the core bundle, page 224 in the pagination of the PDF. I think there's a slight glitch there, my lords, because two pages were inserted, a draft order, and that's knocked everything out on the paper pagination by two pages. I don't know if your lordships are all using the PDF or using the paper bundles. I'm using the electronic one. I'm using paper, just to make it difficult. I'm sorry, that means, my lord, deducting two each time I get paper. I have to deduct two from the number you give. Yes, I'll try to remember to do it, my lord, but if I don't, that's the answer. So, my lords, before we get to paragraph 
four of this um, reading, just to summarise, is a lengthy chunk setting out what Sib says a reasonable banker in HSBC's position would have known by the 1st of August 2008. And then one comes on to what Sib says the consequences would have been. And there's a rather, if I may say so, convoluted um, articulation of what the reasonable banker would have thought. But then one comes on, subparagraph five, to what it said the reasonable banker would have done. And that is placed a freeze on transactions on the accounts pending the completion of HSBC's procedures and or the making of inquiries in order to ascertain whether the matters of suspicion referred to above could be explained by SIB. And then if we go to page 232, um, after another chunk of reading directed to it being far from probable that HSBC could have satisfied itself that all was well, uh, we get to paragraph 170, which then says, as a result of not being able to satisfy itself, uh, the freeze which ought to have been placed on the accounts would have remained in place until SIB was placed into liquidation. So to pick up what the Master of the Rolls was saying a moment ago, it is no part of SIB's pleaded case against HSBC that SIB would have entered insolvency any earlier than it did, um, or indeed um, that, that, that the losses involved in carrying on after that point uh, more generally could have been avoided. So um, you say the judge um, misunderstood the case because he said had they put a freeze on the accounts, the balloon would have gone up, and that was the claimant's case, but you say no. That's right. Um, it's not. It's no part of Sib's pleaded case that if HSBC had acted as it says it should, the fraud would have stopped in its tracks on the 1st of August 2008, or that Sib would have gone into liquidation any earlier. Sib had an array of other banking relationships through which to conduct its business. Um, and any such case, my lord, would have been a completely different case on loss. Um, it's important to bear that in mind because we do say that Mr Justice Nuji went adrift in that respect. It would have been a completely different case on loss because one would then not have been looking at the outflow from the accounts. One would have had to look at the entire SIB empire, all of its banking relationships, the change over all of its assets and liabilities over the interim period. That's simply not how SIB puts its case. Now, my Lord, SIB's pleading on loss is set out on this same page, paragraph 171. One has first the balance on the account set out, and that's what produces when one converts all of that to sterling, the, the 80 million figure. And then one has the balances paid out over the period 1st of August 2008 to 17th of February 2009. Then a reiteration of the point that the accounts should have been frozen. And then at four, if HSBC had acted as it ought to have done, SIB would have had available to it the distribution to its creditors and the liquidation, the sums referred to in subparagraph two above, which total approximately 118.5 million when converted, alternatively the balances. Accordingly, SIB has suffered loss and damage in that amount. The defense then pleads for that, my lords, at paragraph 94, that's page 300 in the the PDF pagination 298, paper pagination. Uh, paragraph 94.1, my lord, has always been our primary case, subparagraph A, um, that the relevant payments, where they went directly or indirectly to repay investors, discharged SIB's liabilities pro tanto and did not cause any loss or damage to SIB. We then pleaded a fallback position in case we were wrong about A fallback position, if there was a loss in the funds leaving the accounts, was that that could be mitigated by SIB clawing the payments back and there would then be no loss. As your Lordships adverted to, it's since been confirmed by the Privy Council that under the insolvency regime in Antigua, SIB can't claw back any of the payments to investors. Now, if we're right about our plea at A, that there's no loss, whether clawbacks are available or not is irrelevant that would only go to mitigation if we were wrong. We needn't trouble with 94.2 because none of the payments we're concerned with today we now know are in that category. 94.3 on the next page, if your lordships could just run your eye down that, that is 
that um, payments out of the accounts transferred to other accounts uh, held by SIB remained assets of SIB. SIB's reply to all of that, my lords, is at page 391, uh, tab 16, paragraph 80. And at subparagraph 1, they denied that any liabilities were extinguished by the payments on the basis the payments were preferences. Now, that is no longer SIB's position, as I'll come to. Their position now is that the debts were indeed discharged, as we had always said, but that that doesn't amount to a benefit to SIB in the full amount of the debts so discharged. There was then at subparagraph two a somewhat bizarre suggestion that any loss arose at a point in time before the monies were received by the investors. Now, that wasn't pursued below. It's not in SIB's skeleton for this appeal, and I'd suggest your lordships can ignore that. And at subparagraph three, they then said in any event they were taking steps to mitigate. Now, as I say, um, the proceedings that are there referred to in Antigua then produced the decision of, of the Privy Council, and uh, SIB now accepts that the effect of that decision is there's no answer to the point that the debts in question were indeed uh, discharged. Paragraph 81 pleads to our paragraph 94.3 and um, asserts that as a matter of causation, the ultimate cause of such loss was HSBC's breaches of duty. We say that's plainly not sufficient, that's just but for causation uh, and doesn't answer the point that the monies in Toronto Dominion's accounts and SIB's name remained SIB's assets. Now, my lord, it's fair to say, as regards that point, that before Mr Justice Nuji, having just had confirmation from Ms Jenkins that the money that went from HSBC to Toronto Dominion also ended up with CD investors, we concentrated on the point that was common to all of the outflow from HSBC, the discharge of debt point. And I acknowledge we didn't pursue before Mr Justice Nuji as a separate and distinct no-loss point the fact that the, the money ended up in another account of SIBS. Um, <clears throat> however, that was a point that was raised in our evidence in support of the application. I'll just give the references. Flat paragraph 19, supplemental tab 1, page 6, and responded to by Ms Jenkins, paragraph 15, supplemental tab 2, page 34. Um, I don't, of course, criticise Mr Justice Nuji for not having dealt with it as a separate and distinct point. But we do raise it as such before this court. SIB's been on notice of that since we served our grounds of appeal on the 11th of September 2020. It's a point on undisputed facts which arises squarely from our pleading. Now I'm going to concentrate primarily on the point about discharge of debt that's common to all of the funds, but I'll circle back at the end of my submissions to that separate point about the effect of the transfer to Toronto Dominion because that would be a freestanding basis to strike out the claim as regards that 36 million. And Lord, I was going to move on next to the Quince Care duty. I know that the Master of the Lords uh, of the Rolls will be very familiar with it from uh, Singularis, but the other members of this court perhaps may not have come across it before. After all, Singularis is the only case to date in which a bank has been found liable for breach of the Quince Care duty since Quince Care was decided. Uh, quin the Quince Care duty is a, a, an aspect of the contractual duty to exercise reasonable skill and care. It's a common law duty of care. We have Quince Care in the authority bundle, tab 9. And we can pick it up at the top of page 159. Uh, one has there the reference to the fact that it's uh, an implied term contract of reasonable skill and care. And then at C, one has the um, analysis. Given that the bank owes a legal duty to exercise reasonable care in and about executing customers' order to transfer money, it's nevertheless a duty which must, generally speaking, be subordinate to the bank's other conflicting contractual duties. X hypothesize on considering a case where the bank received a valid and proper order which is prima facie bound to execute 
execute promptly on pain of incurring liability for consequential loss to the customer. How are these conflicting duties to be reconciled in a case where the customer suffered loss because it subsequently established the order to transfer money was an act of misappropriation of money by the director or officer? Ms. Justice Stane then adverts to the possibility of a dishonest assistance claim if, of course, one can make out dishonesty. We'll come to that separately on the dishonesty appeal. But then he goes on to say, in real life, such a stark situation seldom arises. The critical question is what lesser state of knowledge on the part of the bank will oblige the bank to make inquiries as to the legitimacy of the order. In judging where the line is to be drawn, there are countervailing policy considerations. The law should not impose too burdensome an obligation on bankers, which hampers the effective transacting of banking business unnecessarily. On the other hand, the law should guard against the facilitation of fraud and exact a reasonable standard of care in order to combat fraud and protect bank customers and third parties. To hold a bank's only liable when it's displayed lack of probity would be too restrictive. To impose liability wherever speculation might suggest dishonesty would impose wholly impractical standards. Then he goes on to the sensible compromise, which strikes a fair balance, and that is simply to say a banker must refrain from executing an order if and for as long as the bank has put on inquiry in the sense that he has reasonable grounds, not necessarily proof of leaving the order, is an attempt to misappropriate the funds of the company. So that's the duty that we're concerned with. In singularis, the bank actually appreciated that the customer was on the verge of insolvency, and it failed to react to glaring signs that payments the director was making were a fraud on the company. Now those, my lord, were misappropriations in the straightforward sense that they were payments for the director's own purposes, siphoning money away to other parts of his business empire in the face of insolvency, and they were unrelated to any genuine debts of the company. So the facts of singularis were very different. We're only concerned with how the duty is characterized in the master of the rules judgment. We have it at tab 31 in the authorities bundle. One of the questions on the appeal, my lords, was whether it mattered that the claim was, sorry, that the company was bringing the claim for the benefit of its creditors, and that issue is addressed at paragraphs 81 and following. We can pick it up at page 1050 in the PDF pagination. As one sees at paragraph 81, it was common ground that the Quinn's care duty was owed to singularis and not directly to its creditors. It is, of course, similarly common ground here that the duty is owed to SIB and not to SIB's creditors, and I fully accept that what SIB plans to do with the money isn't relevant. The point that interests us about loss, of course, didn't arise on the facts of singularis because there was no question of discharging genuine liabilities of the company. If we go on to your lordship's exposition of the nature of the Quinn's care duty, you can pick that up on the following page, 1050, sorry, 51 in the PDF. Sorry, I'm muddling myself between the two paginations now. In fact, I'm muddling myself about the fact there is a difference. Happily, in the authorities, there's no difference. So we're all on the same page, quite literally. Just to summarize, my lords, that Daiwa had tried to argue a point based on Bilta about public policy precluding recovery in circumstances where the claim was brought for the benefit of creditors to whom no direct duty was owed. As one sees in the middle of page 1051, paragraph 86, your lordship didn't find it helpful to consider the problem through the lens of Bilta and the very different duties owed by auditors. I could ask your lordships just to read paragraph 86, where your lordship said that the matter could be decided on a more straightforward and well-established basis. You went on to refer to the Quinn's care duty as narrow and well-defined to protect the banker's customer from losing funds held in the bank account with that banker whilst the circumstances put the banker on inquiry. Not comparable with the scope of duty owed by auditors, entirely different character. And then halfway down the next paragraph, your lordship said it's hard to see how a duty not to pay away money in a customer's account without proper inquiry can 
vary depending on the state of solvency of the customer. Conversely, it's clear that the circumstances that make the banker on inquiry may vary according to whether or not, to the banker's knowledge, the customer's insolvent or not. And then at the top of the following page, in my judgment, in the circumstances of this case, the solvency of Singularis was relevant to the question of whether Daiwa was in breach of its Quince Care duty to the company, but not to the scope of that duty. The duty was to protect the funds held in Singularis' account from fraudulent disposition. The fact that vindicating that right will benefit only creditors rather than the company itself is nothing to the point. And then further down the same page, that's contrasted with the difficult scope of duty points that can arise in the case of auditors, the kinds of problems that have bedeviled the analysis as regards causation, remoteness, and measure of loss in those types of cases. And at E, your lordship parked all of that firmly on the not relevant pile, saying the same questions can't sensibly be asked in relation to the Quince Care duty. That duty is a binary one to stop payment from being made out of the customer's bank account in certain very limited circumstances. It's unlike the duty of an auditor in reporting publicly on a company's financial statements. And again, further down that same paragraph, the limited scope of the Quince Care duty makes it obvious it's only to protect the customer from the loss of its money, and only the customer can vindicate a claim for breach of it. Now, my lords, what we take from that in terms of the consequences for the problem your lordships are confronted with is this. Whether a bank is liable for breach of that limited binary Quince Care duty in having paid out when it should not ought to be a simple question capable of a simple answer. Our analysis supplies a simple answer fitted to the narrow scope of the duty, and which doesn't alter according to whether or not the company is insolvent. One would expect that it will be a rare Quince Care claim that seeks to make a bank liable for payments that have discharged debts to the customer or moved funds to another account of the customer. But the answer in such a case should be there's no loss and no liability regardless of the state of solvency of the customer. Certainly in circumstances such as ours where it's not alleged the bank actually knew the customer to be insolvent. On SIB's approach, whether there's a loss will depend on a multifactorial analysis. Whether the customer is insolvent, quite how deeply insolvent they are, whether they have or have not clawed back the relevant payments, whether they could or could not do so under the relevant insolvency regime, indeed whether they're in any formal insolvency process. Now that gives rise to a host of questions, my lord. What if the company is insolvent when the payments are made but subsequently becomes, sorry, what if the company is solvent when the payments are made but subsequently and before the trial becomes insolvent? Does that transform the bank's liability? And what about a customer who at the date of breach appeared to be heading inexorably towards insolvency but then stages a miraculous recovery? Is there a loss or isn't there? Now SIB's loss skeleton, paragraph 64, and the reference, we don't need to turn it up, is page 132, suggests that if a mildly insolvent company returns to solvency, there may be no loss. Can that be right? What if Mr. Stanford had stashed his ill-gotten gains under a metaphorical mattress and had been ordered to and able to restore SIB's assets to the position they would have been in? Would that have altered the analysis as to whether there's a loss for which HSBC is liable through having acted on instructions to make payments not to Mr. Stanford but to bona fide investors? Now we say those questions illustrate what we say is the unprincipled and unworkable nature of the distinction drawn by the judge. A bank caught between its duty to act promptly on a customer's instruction and the quince care duty, which requires it to refrain in narrowly defined circumstances, should not find itself facing such a shifting and protean liability 
if it gets that judgment call wrong. If the money is actually lost to the company, well, that's one thing. But if it settles a debt, the simple answer is the right answer. There's no loss for which the bank's liable, and that's the answer regardless of solvency. We say SIB's overcomplication of a simple duty comes about because SIB is seeking to graft on to the Quince Care duty an approach to remedy derived from cases that are concerned with a fundamentally different duties owed by directors. And it's doing that in an endeavor to get past the point that there's no loss. SIB relies on those cases to support the correctness of the judge's reasoning, even though the judge himself didn't base his conclusion on those cases. Now, I'm going to come to the individual cases later, but by way of an overview of what we say about Directors owe a trustee-like duty in relation to the assets of the company. Now, whereby breach of that duty, they cause the assets of the company to be paid away, the starting position is they're liable to restore the assets of the trust to what they would have been but for the breach. That is not a liability which depends on establishing a loss to the company. Secondly, the duties owed by directors are altered fundamentally by impending insolvency. The interests of creditors then intrude, and the directors are in a practical sense managing assets to which the creditors are prospectively entitled through the mechanism of liquidation. Once that duty to consider the interests of creditors is engaged, if the director then breaches their duty in a way that adversely impacts a premier pursue distribution between creditors, the court has available to it various discretionary remedies to restore the company assets and thereby restore the premier pursue distribution to what it would have been but for the breach. There are statutory remedies such as section 212 of the Insolvency Act and its predecessor section 333 of the Companies Act 1948. Those are available once a company is in liquidation, but even when a company is not in liquidation, so none of that applies, the fiduciary nature of the relationship makes available equitable remedies that do not depend on proving the company has suffered a loss, as opposed to showing that the distribution to creditors may be in some way adversely affected. Now we say of all that, none of that has anything to do with damages against a third party for breach of a common law duty of care. And by trying to integrate principles drawn from those misfeasance cases into the analysis here as to whether there's a loss for the purposes of a duty of care claim, SIB is creating a kind of Frankenstein's monster, an unholy hybrid between equitable remedies and the common law, which we say will wreak havoc in an area of law which ought to be simple and straightforward of application. So, my lord, with that preamble, can I turn... If Mr. Penning won't take that personally, but can I say more seriously just for a moment, do you accept that if there were a sustainable claim for dishonest assistance, the calculation of equitable compensation might be in a completely different category from the calculation of the common law damages for a breach of the Quinn's care duty? Absolutely it would be, because one would stand in the shoes of the defaulting trustee. And my lord, that's why we have never advanced the no loss point as an answer to the dishonest assistance claim. It's always been advanced as an answer to the Quinn's care claim, my lord. So dishonest assistance is a whole different ballgame, precisely because the remedies are different. One is in equitable territory. And there our answer is a quite different answer, that there is no viable dishonest assistance claim on the face of the pleadings. And we'll come to that after Mr. Fenwick has opened his appeal. My lord, I was going to go next to NEMGIA, that being the authority on which we relied. And I thought it made sense to take that ahead of the judgment in order to see why we say the judge was wrong to distinguish it. 
the same in order in relation to NEMGIA. Clearly, what we're concerned with here is the proper application on our facts of the net loss principle. And the net loss principle itself is not an issue between us. We've set out various quotes at paragraphs 14 to 17 of our loss skeleton. What divides us is how that principle is to be, developed, to be applied on the facts here. Now, we say the answer is, in fact, so obvious that it's quite hard to find an authority that squarely addresses the point. But we did find one in the form of NEMGIA. So if we could look at that, that's at tab 12. And can I just summarize um, the facts of NEMGIA? <clears throat> the original position. Just before you do, just tell me the page in the. I'm so sorry. Um, well, it's um, tab 12, page 197 in the PDF is the head note. And we can jump ahead. I was just going to give you a preamble in terms of the facts, but in terms of the next paragraph we'll refer to, that's at page 204. <clears throat> just to summarize the facts, the original position was that NEMGIA was liable to pay its policyholders, <clears throat> but it was entitled to an indemnity from NEMIC, which had been set up as a, the vehicle through which AGF bought the goodwill and assets of NEMGIA's broke business. Now, out of concern that NEMGIA was going to end up in an insolvent liquidation, as indeed it subsequently did, and specifically with a view to avoiding the Paris Pursue distribution that would take effect in that scenario, AGF and NEMIC entered into arrangements whereby policyholders were paid direct by NEMIC. The effect of those direct payment arrangements was that NEMGIA was relieved of a liability to the policyholders, but it no longer had the benefit of the indemnity. NEMGIA brought claims in tort against NEMIC and AGF, so proof of loss was a necessary element. And Mr. Justice Lightman determined on a preliminary issue that in circumstances where NEMGIA's balance sheet position was unaffected, there was no loss, and he struck out the action. So Mr. Thumption QC, as he then was, walked from court triumphant, and NEMGIA was left to seek such remedies as might or might not be available to it under the insolvency legislation via the separate proceedings it had commenced in the company's court. Now, we're interested in the tort claims, which are the second action referred to, uh, subparagraph two on page 204. Uh, and um, one sees there summarized NEMGIA's complaint. NEMGIA complains UK policyholders wrongfully prevented from making any claims against NEMGIA, seeks by way of relief in the form of damages to be placed in the same financial position it would have been in. If such claims had been made, NEMGIA would have been entitled to obtain recoveries from NEMIC equal in amount to the claims to be met. Though the price for this entitlement would have been a liability in the self-same sum, it's contended that NEMGIA would have been better off, but prior to liquidation, it could have decided what to do with the receipts. Uh, and then after liquidation, acting by the liquidators, NEMGIA would have paid all creditors ratedly and not the UK policyholders in full. So specifically, the impact on distribution in the insolvency was part of NEMGIA's argument as to why it should be treated as having suffered a loss. Um, page 205, my lords, one has the issue on the preliminary issue formulated at B. Has NEMGIA suffered any loss that would give rise to damages? And at the foot of that page, at I, Mr. Justice Lightman says this, the short but perhaps novel issue of law is whether in such circumstances NEMGIA has suffered any recoverable damage or loss. For myself, I'd have thought the answer was plainly and obviously in the negative and one requiring no elaboration. But in view of NEMGIA's de declared inter intention to take this matter further, I think it right to spell out the arguments and my reasoning. And then foot of page 206, he says, in the ordinary case, where the question arises whether the net loss approach should be adopted, the plaintiff who's the victim of the tort or breach of contract suffers a loss and there, thereafter, by reason of such loss, receives certain benefits, which in whole or part remove him of the consequences. Now, we are the ordinary case. 
So he goes on to say that the startling feature of this case is that the defendants allege wrongdoing in the first instance occasion, not a loss, but a relief from liability. And that, he says, can't of itself be a loss. The complaint, the only possible complaint, is the loss of the concomitant and knock-on effect of such relief from liability, namely the loss of the right to an indemnity in respect of such liability. As a matter of common sense and law of damages, the liability to UK policyholders and the right to the indemnity are a single package and inseparable. Two sides of the same coin must unquestionably be netted off one against the other. There can be no basis for any exception to the application of the general rule to which I deferred. It must be an a for sure I case. So the startling aspect made it an a for sure I case, but none of that disturbs the proposition that the answer would have been the same in what you might call the ordinary case. He says, I fail to see how the loss of this package can possibly have occasioned them any substantial damage. Then he goes on to address the arguments that were addressed by Mr. Burton and QC to the contrary effect. We don't need to trouble with the first argument, B and D. That amounted to saying that NGO could have sat on the money from NEMIC in breach of the terms of the policies, and Mr. Justice Lightman was having no truck with that. But Mr. Burton's ingenuity was not exhausted, and he came up with a different loss argument one sees at E. If your lordships could just run your eyes down that. His argument was that the liquidators would have been enabled and obliged by the insolvency rules to distribute all the reinsurance proceeds received from NEMIC amongst the larger body of creditors, peri pursu. Those proceeds are now not available for this purpose because of the direct payment arrangement, and this constitutes a recoverable loss. I do not think that the withholding from the liquidators of the ability to apply the reinsurance proceeds in this matter could constitute such a loss to NEMGIA. The relevant question is, what loss did NEMGIA suffer? In money terms, is NEMGIA worse off? The statutory scheme for distribution of the assets of NEMGIA in the liquidation, the manner and consequences of the performance of their duties by the liquidators are irrelevant, and this is so even though the consequences of the direct payment arrangement in this regard were in the forefront of the mind of NEMIC in devising and implementing the direct payment arrangement. And one has also at the top of the following page, page 208 in the PDF, the critical focus of attention must be the assets and liabilities, rights and obligations of the company. The consequences of the direct payment arrangement are in this respect neutral and according no substantial damages can be awarded. The reality is the only persons who suffered a loss and can have been intended to suffer a loss are the creditors of NEMGIA other than UK policyholders. So, my lord, we say that gives the answer to the question that the master of the rolls posed to me a while back. It makes no difference to the analysis that one can discern a loss in terms of the distribution to the creditors. That is not the relevant loss. The relevant loss is, is there any loss to the company? And it's true that in NEMGIA, the problem presented itself in a more startling form than the ordinary case. On the facts, NEMGIA's argument amounted to saying it shouldn't have been relieved from a liability because it could have derived certain advantages from the corresponding benefit of the indemnity. But the right to an indemnity was an asset which NEMGIA had been deprived of, so it alleged, by a tortious arrangement between the defendants. And the reasoning of Mr. Justice Lightman was that that asset was inseparably paired with a liability. On our facts, the funds paid out from the account are an asset which is just as inseparably linked to the discharge of a liability which results from that payment. And the argument that the loss and the benefit are two sides of the same coin, we say applies with just as much force. There was no appeal then, is that right? I don't think so, my lord. You can't find any trace of one. Despite the threatened appeal in the... Well, it seems they thought better of that and they sought to try their luck perhaps in the company's court. I don't know what became of it, my lord. But we do, we say that the critical focus that this court must adopt is the same. The critical focus is whether there's a net impact on the assets and liabilities of the company. And the second important thing one takes from that is the distribution of assets in the eventual liquidations are relevant in assessing that impact on the company, just as it was in NEMGIA. And that was so even though, my lord, the very purpose of the arrangement in NEMGIA was to interfere with that distribution. So we say that's squarely a parallel 
being, just as this case is, a claim in tort against a third party. Um, in ours, it's obviously a duty of care, but in either case, a case where damages were a necessary element, as distinct from a claim against a fiduciary. And it shows that the proposition there was no loss in the absence of a net impact was regarded as being so blindingly obvious as hardly to need stating. And that, we say, explains the dearth of authority on well, this point. I mean, there, there might have been a claim um, against the against one or more of the parties to the arrangement between uh, Nemco and uh, whatever they were called, Nemec and AGS, because uh, under the Insolvency Act, um, because they were, in fact, as you rightly say, disrupting the proper distribution of assets pari passu after the company had become insolvent. But, well, um, but, but that wasn't the claim that was brought, which is why I imagine you keep on saying, well, they may have gone to the company's court. And well, they did go to the company's court, my lord. I don't know what became of their claim there, but they were exactly doing that. They were pursuing in the company's court such remedies as might be available under the insolvency legislation. Yeah, but they had simultaneously they brought the tort claim. Uh, uh, and the point being made was that there was no loss for the purposes of the tort claim, whether there was or wasn't a remedy under the insolvency legislation. It's obviously a separate question. But it didn't affect the analysis that there was no loss for the purposes of the damages claim. No. Well, I mean, there, there might well have been... I mean, I'm trying to think what insolvency claim would have been appropriate. Do we have a report of the claims that were brought? No, my lord, I don't think we do. I mean, if there is one, it would be useful to see, because um, it's quite hard to see how third parties who are not directors and owe no duty directly to the com company could be liable, save in respect of perhaps a, a, a dishonest assistance claim. Well, my lord, yes, and that may be why we find no trace of the company's act. Sorry to interrupt, Ms. Robertson, but is, is this not what is described at the top of page 204 in the PDF, page 198 in the report? Because yes. this Justice Lightman describes the Companies Act proceedings, and he describes the relief that was claimed um, in those proceedings and the basis for that relief. My Lord, your Lordship's absolutely right. I'd forgotten that he gave a description of what was going on within the company's um, uh, company yes. court claim. 238 and 239, which is transactions at an undervalue and preferences and dispositions under violating 127. Yeah. I mean, it's um, if, there is a, if there is a report somewhere in the BCC or something, um, it would be useful to, to get it because it, it might um, demonstrate quite vividly how different the jurisdiction of the insolvency court is to yes. a common law claim. My lord, I, I take that point. We'll, we'll have another look. Miss Hutton, who's, who's with me, will um, see if she can throw any light on, on that aspect of it. I'm, I apologise for that. I hadn't seen that there is a summary of the uh, company court proceedings as opposed to a reference to the fact that they existed. But, but obviously my point is it made no analysis to the difference to, to, it made no difference to the analysis on loss for the purpose of the uh, damages claim. Um, Lord, I should just refer to the Privy Council decision before I move on um, to the judgment. Um, your Lordship has referred to the fact that the Privy Council made a decision in the Stanford International Bank, which we have at tab 35 in the bundle. Now, the, the effect of that decision is not now in issue between us, so I can just summarize. The liquidators were applying for directions, seeking authority to pursue a number of different claims, all of which were directed to rearranging the distribution of assets as between SIBs investors. The Privy Council held, first by a majority, that the statutory provision the liquidators were relying on for their other claims, which related to discretionary remedies unfairly prejudicial conduct, was not available once a company was in liquidation. And secondly, they held unanimously that even if it had been, the basis of the proposed claims was completely misconceived because the investors were bona fide purchasers for value who'd received the payments without notice in circumstances where they were contractually entitled. 
a few lordships note that the key passage is a speech of Lord Briggs, paragraph 66 to 71. Now, my lords, in a context where, as your lordships have seen, Sib's pleaded case in the reply had been to deny that the debts had been discharged, that decision obviously prompted the question how they could possibly continue to maintain that case. And it set us thinking about whether the court should be asked to address the loss point sooner rather than later. So here we all are. The Privy Council decision was in practical terms, I accept, the prompt for us to seek to bring this issue to a head. But our argument before this court does not depend on the quirk of Antiguan law that prevented the liquidators from pursuing clawbacks. It's always been our position that the debts were discharged and that, as a result, there's no loss to Sib. If we're wrong about that, and there is a loss, then the fact clawback isn't available in this particular case means there's no fallback position for us based on failure to mitigate the loss. But if we're right about our primary case, the whole business of what if any adjustment may or may not be possible within the given insolvency process is just not relevant to the Prince Clair claim. So, my lord, with that lengthy preamble, I now turn to Mr. Justice Nugent's judgment. Just before you do, I mean, in paragraph 66, there's a quite general statement, first of all, that the clawback claim is misconceived. But he says expressly, depositors had a contractual entitlement to receive capital and interest by virtue of the simple terms of the certificates of deposit used by SIB, either on redemption or by way of early redemption subject to a discount. There's no suggestion in the liquidator's evidence that they were paid in excess of their entitlements. So that's a clear statement by the Privy Council saying these people were entitled to their money. Yes. And that's quite clear, quite irrelevant, really, to the context in which he says that, because otherwise the clawback claims, which didn't succeed under Antiguan law, wouldn't have got to first base, I suppose. Anyway, that was the view he took. And obviously, Mr. Fenwick was there, so he knows that. Yes. And my lord, we say that that cleared the deck in terms of what had appeared to be an issue between us on the pleadings as to whether the debts had been discharged or not. And one then had to start the analysis from the position they had been. So then what? You were getting to the judge's decision. Yes, my lord. If we go to the core bundle, tab 11. Now, as I said, Mr. Justice Nugent didn't base his decision on the various cases on which the SIB relies. He does refer at paragraph 32 of his judgment to HLC and West Mercia. And I'll come to those cases later. He refers to them for no more than this, the possibility, as he put it, that one might, by analogy, apply a similar approach in order to address any injustice to HSBC from the approach to damages he'd adopted. But he approached the question as to whether SIB had, in fact, suffered a loss as one of principle rather than one governed by authority, other than NEMGIA, which he distinguished. Now, he starts, if we go to paragraph 24 of the judgment, and it's page 141 in the PDF, from the proposition that a solvent person is no worse off if a payment discharges a debt subject to the possibility, which he goes on to address at paragraph 25, of some sort of consequential loss. Now, of course, that would be a claim for loss that's separate and distinct from the payment itself, and it would need to be specifically pleaded. There's no such claim pleaded here, so we can forget about consequential loss. And in my submission, it follows that Mr. Justice Nugent would have accepted, had SIB been solvent, that there was no loss here. But his concern was, as one sees at paragraph 26, that the analysis may well be different if you're an insolvent individual or company. And then paragraph 27 
And he makes the same point again in paragraph 40. If we could just scoot forward to that at page 142. Sorry, not 142, 144. Mr. Justice Nugent, both those points in his judgment suggest that the balloon would have gone up sooner than it did. In paragraph 40, he says, SIB would be better off if the balloon had gone up on the 1st of August 2008, as it said it should have done. Now, he seems to suggest that SIB would have entered liquidation either then or shortly thereafter. Now, as I've shown your lordships, that's not SIB's pleaded case, and doubtless that's not their case, among other things, because SIB had a range of other correspondent banking relationships available to it. At all events, we say the analysis doesn't differ according to how swiftly or otherwise SIB would have moved into a liquidation process. The objection of principle to the judge's reasoning is the same in any event. If we go back to paragraph 28, page 141, Mr. Justice Nugent there embarks on a counterfactual. And we say as he develops that counterfactual, it's clear that it begs the very question it sets out to answer and is the wrong counterfactual, because it's focused, as we'll see as the reasoning is developed, on the position of creditors and not that of the company. So although Mr. Justice Nugent says in this paragraph he's focusing on the position of the company, that's not what he in fact does. We say that the impact on the company can really only be measured by reference to the balance sheet. There's no other way to measure it, and Nemgia was correct in that respect. You can't just ignore the fact that the liabilities are less by the same amount as the payments that go out to CD investors. You can't ignore that if you're assessing the company's financial position. That reduction in liabilities only becomes a matter of indifference, to use the judge's word, if you look at it from the perspective of the financial position of creditors, because of how little impact it would have on their shares in circumstances where SIBS is insolvent as it is. But that is a loss to creditors, and you can't transform it into a loss to the company. In the last couple of sentences of paragraph 28, the judge also floats the possibility. You see there, without a full investigation, one can't tell whether the total quantum of liabilities was in fact greater than the total liabilities would have been back in August 2008. He floats the possibility that given that SIB continued to trade and will have acquired new liabilities, one can't tell whether the overall liabilities are less. Now, that's just not a relevant inquiry, my lords. As your lordships have seen, SIB is not bringing a claim against HSBC for causing it to continue trading wrongfully. That's not the nature of the limited quinsecare duty. It's not the basis on which SIB has pleaded loss. That would be a completely different claim, and it would require, as I said before, analysis of the overall impact of continuing to trade across all of SIB's different banking relationships, all of its assets and liabilities, not just the outflow from the HSBC accounts alone. It's not SIB's case, so we can dismiss those last two sentences from the equation and move on to paragraph 29. I mean, just pausing there for a second, Ms. Robertson, you would have thought that the liquidators would be in preeminently the best position to say, to make the allegation, if appropriate, you should have done this. Had you done this, the balloon would have gone up at a particular date, namely the 1st of August, immediately after you brought to attention the position you were worried about, and that the overall balance sheet position of SIB deteriorated. By so much, yes. By so much. So there's a perfectly proper, properly available claim to the liquidators, but they have chosen to put their money on a claim that's not properly available. I mean, that's what you say. That's 
case. And it's, because it seems to me, it's strange. I mean, we'll hear Mr. Fennick, but I mean, these liquidators have no doubt spent years, literally, investigating the affairs of Mr. Stanford and his supposed bank. I don't think probably gracing it with that name is very fair. But anyway, they've investigated. They're in the best position to know. And they've put their money on this claim, is what it comes to. And therefore, they must stand or fall by it. Well, my lord, yes. And there's a host of factual material that would become relevant if this went forward that throws some light on why that claim is not pleaded in those terms. One has to start with the fact that everybody else is considered supposed to be innocent. So the inquiries one makes are being answered by innocent people who themselves believe the business to be non-fraudulent. One has the fact that the SEC itself, although it had some more information about SIB, certainly than HSBC had, and concerns about it, didn't act. One has the fact that the auditor and the regulator have been bribed. So any complaint to the Antiguan regulator is not going to get you very far. There's a whole bunch of things that come into why the liquidators may have taken the view that that alternative way of putting this case was simply not sustainable. But all your lordships need to concern yourself with is that is not the case that was advanced before your lordships. I'm slightly puzzled because it would only have taken, I mean, I know the judge was delivering this judgment on Friday afternoon at the end of term, 31st of July, which is not a judge's favorite time for delivering judgments. And I think it's his last judgment before he joined us here at the Court of Appeal. But you didn't interrupt him and say, no, you've got this wrong. That's not their case, did you? When he said twice in paragraphs 28 and 40, the balloon would have gone up, which means he is understanding that a different series of events would have transpired when that was not alleged in the pleading. Your lordship's right. I didn't. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't quick enough off the mark or quick enough in my appreciation of quite how he was analyzing it. One, of course, looks very closely in the course of preparing an appeal at that. And this then leaps out in a way that it probably didn't at 5.30 on the Friday afternoon. So I'm afraid, my lord. Sorry, I say 5.30 because I think that was where I was at the relevant time. But so, my lord, absolutely. If I had spotted that in the same way at the time, it would have been appropriate to raise a flag. But my lord, there it is for what it's worth. Now, even without that, my lord, we say it's just Nugent's gone adrift in terms of where he's focusing. But what it does is perhaps give a clue to what the underlying concern was that was sort of motivating his perspective on the case. Articulating the point that concerns your lordship. Once your liabilities vastly exceed your assets, it's a matter of indifference whether you have 5 billion assets or 6 billion of assets. Sorry, 5 billion of liabilities, Freudian slip there, or 6 billion of liabilities. That was actually the judge's formulation, which Mr. Fennick adopted and developed. And the point's repeated at paragraph 30, that it doesn't matter to the company whether its liabilities are 5 billion or 6 billion. So reducing them from that higher figure to the lower makes no odds is the thrust of the argument. Sorry, my lord, in that way, Mr. Justice Nugent makes the outcome depend on the sheer extent of SIB's particular insolvency, which is, it has to be said, spectacular. And he's introducing the idea that if you're massively insolvent in that kind of a way, the precise amount of your liabilities is a matter of indifference. We say, and I've already outlined some of the questions we say this would give rise to, that this gives rise to unprincipled and unworkable distinctions. And the suggestion in SIB's skeleton about the mildly insolvent claimant 
the logic of that position would be, as we say at paragraph 34 of our skeleton, that an increase in liabilities would equally be a matter of indifference, and that's patently wrong. It gives the lie to the whole analysis, because it's the precise extent of the company's liabilities that are relevant to dictating the point at which any, and if so, what distribution can be made to creditors in liquidation. And that remains the case, even if the net position at the start of the liquidation is a very large negative figure. From the perspective of the company, as opposed to the perspective of the creditors, discharge of a debt is a benefit to the full extent of that discharge. The balance sheet will reflect that the company is better off to that full extent than it would have been without the discharge. And that's so even if, when you shift the perspective to the perspective of the creditors, that effect may be much diluted because of the depth of the insolvency. And we say the very fact that Mr. Justice Nugent refers to West Mercia and HLC in paragraph 32 betrays the fact his focus has shifted to the financial position of the creditors and not that of the company, which is where it needs to be. And I'll come to West Mercia after the break when I come to SIP's cases. I'll just finish on the judgment, my lord, and then perhaps we could take the shorthand break. Paragraph 39, Mr. Justice Nugent there distinguishes NEMGIA on the footing that all NEMGIA had lost was the opportunity to get in money because it had been deprived of the opportunity to expose itself to a liability. We say the case can't be satisfactorily distinguished on that basis. It was about the loss of an asset in the form of a right of indemnity, and you have my points about two sides of the coin and the impact on the distribution to creditors not being relevant. Paragraph 40, I have already said, seems to be influenced by this idea that the fraud might have been stopped in its tracks. Fundamentally different case. My lord, that was everything I had on the judgment. I was going to go on to the way in which one might test the proposition around benefit by reference to restitution cases and then the cases on which SIP relies. Might that be a convenient moment to take a break? Yes, very good, Ms. Robertson. We'll adjourn now. We'll resume at two minutes past 12 to allow the silence to take place whilst we're breaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
see that we have Lord Justice Moylan and Lord Justice Arnold back, and Ms. Robertson and Mr. Fenwick, so please proceed with your submissions. Thank you, Your Honour. As we said at paragraph 43 of our loss skeleton, references tab 8, page 105, one can test the proposition that discharge of debt is not a benefit to an insolvent company by reference to whether it would be treated as such in a claim for restitution of the funds, and we say it would be. One can, in fact, illustrate that, my lords, by re-cleaving. We now have that at tab 2 of the supplemental slip. I don't think we need to turn it up. I can summarise. In short, all members of the Court of Appeal agreed that a director discharging debts which had been guaranteed by a company that was insolvent was a benefit to that company, just as in Liggett and Barclays, which you also have in that supplemental clip at tab 1, the discharge of a debt had been a benefit to the solvent company there. The claim failed in re-cleaving, not because there was no benefit, but because the company, having only one director at the relevant time, was in court, couldn't request, agree, instruct, or authorise anything, and so, unlike Liggett, the director couldn't be taken to be acting under a general authority for the company. So the point I take from it, I accept, is obiter, but there was no suggestion at all that the analysis on benefit specifically differed because the company was insolvent rather than solvent. Of course, having made good their claim, claimants in such a case would have to take their place in the queue of creditors vis-à-vis an insolvent company, but the analysis on benefit doesn't differ. So we say insolvency is not a justification for departing from the simple analysis as to benefit, which CIV acknowledges would otherwise have applied on our facts. And as regards the effect of the payments which are alleged to have been paid out in breach of a quince care duty, CIV has had the full benefit of the discharge of debts and should give credit in that full amount. And alternatively, CIV didn't lose the funds as a consequence of the breach because they just migrated to another account in its name. That's the £36 million that goes to Toronto Dominion. So now let me turn to the cases on which CIV relies and CIV's submissions about those cases. Could we pick up CIV's submissions at paragraph 32 of CIV's loss skeleton, that's tab 9 of the core bundle? Page 118. So paragraph 32 starts by summarising the classic statement about director's duties in the face of impending insolvency from West Mercia, and we have no quarrel with any of that. Where we take issue is the statement partway down that paragraph that a payment that reduces the assets available to the company to distribute to its creditors is likely to cause the company a loss, even if it's reduced the company's liabilities to the same extent. Now it's in the next two sentences that CIV advances its justification for that claim. It's said that HSBC's action in paying has deprived the liquidator of the answer it would otherwise have had in resisting the creditor's claim for payment, namely that the creditor is only entitled to their rateable proportion on a pari passu distribution. Now that argument, my lords, is sleight of hand, because CIV, at the point in time when these payments were made, did not have that answer vis-à-vis the creditor. The investors who initiated redemption requests were entitled to their full whack. One doesn't need the Privy Council decision to know that. Liquidation is the point at which everything changes. It's only at that point in time when the company enters liquidation and not before that, if you like, an iron curtain comes clanging down and creditors become entitled to receive only their rateable share on a pari passu distribution. 
That doesn't affect the correct measure of loss as at the time of the breach. Well, I'm taking it that there was no petition presented to wind up because that might not be the case where there's a petition to wind up. But I think here the compulsory winding up took place in April and the petition was not presented or no application was made to the court before the arrest of Mr. Stanford in February. That's right. So throughout the entire period we're concerned with, there's no question of the liquidation regime having been engaged. I mean, just to help me with this, I noticed that there were receiver managers appointed, which I take it is sort of our equivalent of provisional liquidators, appointed the minute Mr. Stanford had his collar felt. Well, that may be so, my lord, but of course the period of the claim ends at that point. So we're not concerned, as it were, with how that position changed after that point. For the entire period of the claim, they were entitled to their full payment. Just for the sake of good order, I found it a bit difficult to get a sort of insolvency chronology out of these papers. And if either of you or both of your juniors or some of your juniors together could agree a document that just says what the insolvency events were, it would help me. So, you know, when Mr. Stanford was arrested by the SEC, when the first insolvency petition or whatever and the application for the appointment of receiver managers was made and so on, that would really help me. My lord, I hear what your lordship says. It may be that Mr. Fenwick will be rather better placed to provide that than we do. I don't think we have all of that information in the evidence. Mr. Fenwick has a junior who would no doubt be extremely well. My lord, yes. So moving on then, the Prince Care duty, as we say, is not directed to protecting the solvency of the customer or the interests of creditors in the assets of the company. It doesn't alter according to whether the customer is solvent or not. And at most, where the bank knows the customer to be insolvent, which is not this case, that's relevant to breach. It protects the customer from an apparently valid payment instruction, which is in fact an attempt at misappropriation of the funds of the customer. And that is all that it does. So we say that simple binary duty bears no comparison with the duties owed by directors in the cases that we're about to come on to. It's the director's responsibility to know whether a company is solvent and can properly continue to trade or not. It's the director's, not a bank owing a Prince Care duty, who are under a duty to consider the interests of creditors in circumstances where the company's solvency is in doubt but it's not yet in liquidation. Their duty is different. The remedies available against them for breach of that duty don't depend on proof of loss. The type of loss that will fall within the scope of their duty differs, since it will include an adverse impact on the Paris Pursuit distribution between creditors, whose interest in the assets of the company they're obliged to protect. And the remedies available to the court for breaches of the director's duties include ways to achieve an adjustment that will return the outcome of the distribution to creditors to what it would have been, and we're about to see all of that demonstrated in these cases. Now, in seeking to make insolvency relevant to how one calculates loss in a damages claim, SIB is eliding these quite distinct duties. SIB doesn't cite a single authority relating to damages for breach of a duty of care. So our overarching position in response to all of the cases on which SIB relies is to say none of them assists the court when what the court has to consider is a claim against a third party for breach of a limited duty of care, when loss is a necessary element. They're simply not relevant, we say. Now, having put down that marker... I get that marker. Just a question that one or both of you may be able to answer at some point. You said, which slightly surprised me, that Singularis is the only case in which a breach of the Quinn's Care duty has been established since Quinn's Care, where it was not established, I think. Have there been cases on the Quinn's Care duty where, for example, a loss has been awarded in other common law jurisdictions? Good question, my lord. I'm not aware 
as any. Um, there are other cases which have yet to reach trial where the Quince Care duty is in play. Um, Republic of Nigeria and is it Barclay? Um, sorry, my lord, I'll have to check the precise title of the case. It, it, that, that is one which I know is due to come to trial after ours, where Quince Care is going to be in play. But there's not been another one in this jurisdiction where such a claim has succeeded to date. There might be a, <laughs> for all I know, the floodgates are about to open, but, but, but so far they have not. Um, we, we can look into <laughs> your lordship's questions, but we're not aware of any short answers. Yes, I mean, if, if a little bit of work could be done on that um, overnight. I mean, the, I think there's a very good reason why these claims are rather difficult to establish, and that is because the duty is very narrow. Um, and uh, so you need quite special facts to succeed on a Quince Care claim. Yes. Well, the, the case whose name I was failing to remember is Republic of Nigeria and J.P. Morgan, which has already had one one outing, an interlocutory outing that is due to come to trial on the breach of Quince Care duty. Um, and there's also Phillips and Barclay, which one does have in the bundles, my lord, although it, it, it's a case on um, very different facts. Um, there, um, the claim failed on the basis that the individual has had authorised the payments in question, albeit she was duped into doing so. Um, my Lord, if one could move on to West Mercia, which is the first of the cases on which um, SIB relies, perhaps starting with SIB's submissions about that case. Um, which we will find in tab 9, uh, paragraph 34 at page 119. Um, what Sib says there is that it relies on that case as showing two things. Firstly, the Court of Appeal rejecting the same no loss point we're advancing, namely that a payment that discharges a debt doesn't cause a loss to the company. They say also that it shows that the correct approach is not to look at the net asset position, as was done in Nemgia, but to measure the reduction in the assets available to pay creditors. So let's look at West Mercia to see if that can be made good. Authorities bundle tab 7. Um, page uh, 109. Now, in West Mercia, in circumstances of impending insolvency, a director had paid off an intercompany debt owed to the parent company, of which he was also a director, and whose debts he had guaranteed. The parent company had no assets to repay the sum involved, and as one sees from the head note at one, that was held to be a fraudulent preference and misfeasance. And just above that, in the paragraph that starts D submitted, you have a summary of the point that the director sought to argue on loss. His submission was not that there was no loss because the payment discharged a debt. His argument was that the statement of affairs showed that there were assets available to pay the unsecured creditors apart from the parent company, and therefore he should not be made to pay anything in respect of his misfeasance. And it was on that basis that he submitted there was no loss to the company or any creditor. As one sees in paragraph 3 of the head note, he failed on the evidence to establish that there was no loss to be met by him because the statement of affairs on which he relied was out of date and unreliable, and one then has summarised at 4 the approach adopted to remedy the impact that his misfeasance had had on the distribution to creditors, and we'll come to that in the body of the judgment. So the first thing to say about that case is it is a completely different no-loss point, and there's a reason for that. It would have been no answer for a director guilty of misfeasance simply to point to the fact that the company was no worse off for the balance sheet basis because the fraudulent preference settled a debt, and that's because in the circumstances of impending insolvency, the director's duties extend to the interests of creditors in the assets of the company on a pari distribution. So it's the same point. Different duty, 
brings any adverse impact on that distribution flowing from the seasons squarely within the scope. We go on to page 111. One has there in the left-hand column a citation from Kinsella with a proposition that where a company is insolvent, the interests of creditors intrude. But as one sees from the opening sentence of that same passage, the context for this is when questions of the duty of directors arise. At risk of stating the obvious, we are not concerned with such duties. In the right-hand column, we have the conclusion that Mr. Dodd was guilty of a breach of his duty as director, and then below that, the question posed. The question then remains, what financial relief ought to be granted against him? Now, at the time that West Mercia was decided, the relevant section was section 333 of the Companies Act. It's now section 212 of the Insolvency Act. Can we just look at section 333 so we're clear about what the context was for the decision? It was intended to be at tab 42 of your Lordship's authorities bundle, but your Lordships may have it as a free-floating PDF. Do your Lordships have that? If not, I can simply read it out. Do you want 212 or 333? 333, since that's the one that was actually referred to in West Mercia. There's no substantial difference between the two for our purposes, my Lord. Okay. So, section 333, if in the course of winding up a company, it appears any person who's taken part in the formation or promotion of the company, any past or present director, manager, liquidator, or officer, has misapplied or retained or become liable or accountable for any money or property of the company or been guilty of any misfeasance or breach of trust in relation to the company, the court may, so a discretionary provision, compel him to pay or restore the money or property or any part thereof or to contribute such sum to the assets of the company by way of compensation as the court thinks just. So, the things that the court can do in the exercise of that discretion include restoring the trust fund. This enables the court to protect the pot of assets in respect of which the director stands in the same relation as a defaulting fiduciary and require the director to make good the impact the misfeasance has had on that pot of assets if the court thinks just. So, it's simply not directed to whether the company itself has suffered loss on a balance sheet basis because the nature of the director's duties in a context of impending insolvency requires them to consider the interests of creditors in the assets for distribution and it's about remedies for breach of those specific duties. Now, as I say, section 212 of the Insolvency Act is in substance in the same terms. That's the provision that applies now. So, if we go back to West Mercia where we were at page 111, having referred to re-Washington Diamond Mining and section 333, Lord Justice Dillon continues that the court has a discretion over the matter of relief and the delinquent director can submit that the wind should be tempered because full repayment would result in a windfall for other parties or would produce circularity. And then he goes on to address Mr. Dodd's point on loss as one sees the beginning of the last paragraph on that page. In the present case, Mr. Jones, Mr. Dodd has taken a much bolder course. He's submitted on the facts of this case the misapplication of 4,000 of the company's money for Mr. Dodd's own benefit hasn't caused any loss either to the company or through the company and it's liquidated to any of the creditors of the company. If one then goes on to the next page, there's then the detail as to the statement of affairs and how the argument was being advanced on behalf of Mr. Dodd. As one sees from the paragraph starting the basis of the calculation, his argument was that based on the figures in the statement 
affairs, there was no need to recoup the 4,000 because there was enough to pay the unsecured creditors their due. One sees there the um, final couple of lines of the paragraph that the, um, the sum attributable to unsecured creditors somewhere in the region of 650 or 750, sufficiently franked by the 1322 of uncommitted assets. Um, but Lord Justice Dillon goes on to say, well, a thus estimated state of affairs made over three years ago wholly unreliable. Um, uh, and um, so he dismisses that as a basis for, for, for establishing that there had been uh, no loss to any creditor. At 113, page 113. I mean, the, the position in this case is that it's a completely different exercise from the exercise in West Mercia. In West Mercia, they were seeing, they were deciding what under Section 333 is statutory, um, a statutory provision. Um, the court should, in justice, order to replenish the assets of the company. Um, yes no doubt to allow it to make the same distribution it would otherwise have made. I mean, that's yes, just yes. really not the exercise that's being done here. Absolutely not, my lord. And um, so what, what one has is a conclusion in the middle of the right-hand column at 112 that Mr. Dodd had failed to discharge uh, the evidential uh, burden of showing that there was no loss to any creditor and the onus on him was in that respect. And then that being so, yes, um, then moved on to reconstituting the trust fund and the exercise that one finds described at page 113 of the PDF is all about that. Um, so what Mr. Just, Lord Justice Dillon exercising his discretion as to remedy comes up with is a rough and ready way of achieving justice between those parties, Mr. Dodd and the unsecured creditors. So if the whole amount of recoupment Mr. Dodd, um, the unsecured creditors end up better off than they would have been. So as one sees in the right-hand column, what he does is he orders Mr. Dodd to repay the 4,000, treats the debt to the parent company as notionally increased by that amount, and Mr. Dodd gets his share of the dividend on that notional increase. Now that entire exercise is about restoring the Paris Pursue distribution of assets to the unsecured creditors to what it would have been in the absence of misfeasance. And the entire focus is on the financial position of the creditors. It's not about avoiding overcompensation to the company in respect of a loss to the company. It is just about rectifying that distribution of assets to the creditors. So we say you can take nothing at all from this as regards the calculation of damages when what one needs to show is a loss to the company. And just as it would have been irrelevant Dodd to defend himself by pointing to the fact that the company wasn't worse off on a balance sheet basis. So it's irrelevant for Sid to point to the exercise that Lord Justice Dillon undertook to rectify the Paris Pursue distribution as having any bearing on HSBC's liability. Mr. Dodd couldn't have defended himself in terms of our no loss point because that would have ignored how his duties were altered by impending insolvency. Now, the argument that a payment which went to the liability of the company doesn't cause the company loss was deployed by a defaulting director in a different case, which we have in our bundle. And for precisely the reasons I foreshadowed, which relate to the particular fiduciary status of directors and the nature of their duties, it met with short shrift, and that one was the HLC, which we have at tab 23. So can we make that our next stop? Um, it was a decision of uh, John Randall QC, sitting as a Deputy High Court Judge. We can pick it up at paragraph 136 on page 810. Um, your Lordships will see there at the beginning of paragraph 136, Counsel for the defaulting director was taking an objection of principle that a payment had gone to reduce genuine liability of the company and therefore the company had not suffered a loss. At paragraph 140, um, one, one has the judge referring to the 
director was seeking to distinguish three Palmier PLC, Sandu and Sidhu. That was a decision of Mrs. Justice Proudman relating to whether there was a right of action against a director for payment made at a time when the company was insolvent. And what the judge took from that was that Mrs. Justice Proudman must have approved of the concession that one sees recorded at the top of page 811 of the PDF, namely that the court is not concerned with the assessment of loss or damage to the company. The defendant is required to restore to the company the sum which he has caused to be misapplied. Then at paragraph 141, the judge goes on to, in effect, why that is simply not a relevant inquiry in this context. And he refers there to the fact that a company is in an equivalent position, so far as its directors are concerned, to the fiduciary relationship between a trust fund and trustees. And then at 142, the liability of a defaulting fiduciary who has, by his or her default, allowed the trust fund to become denuded is or includes a liability to restore the trust fund to what it should have been. And then reference in the middle of that citation from Target Holdings to the basic rule that the trustee must restore the trust estate. The caveat to the basic rule that one sees referred to at paragraph 144, where the company is solvent and has continued to discharge all its liabilities, then it may make no sense to restore the trust fund because ordering the director to do so would produce security of action given the director to an indemnity. At 148149, one has the conclusion reached in respect of the payments for discharge liability that they were in breach and that the West Mercia proviso should be applied. So the approach pioneered by Lord Justice Dillon is applied in order to return the distribution to creditors to what it would have been in the absence of misfeasance. Now we say all that one can take from that case is that whether there's a loss to the company on a balance sheet basis is just not a relevant inquiry when one's concerned with the trustee-like duty of a director. And second, that where a director's misfeasance persists in having discharged a liability of the company which should not have been discharged, the court has a discretionary tool available in its armory to remedy the impact of that misfeasance on the distribution. Obviously not deciding this case, but the discharge of the liability of an insolvent company represents a loss to that company. It's simply based on the specific duty of directors to reconstitute the trust fund and it's calculated as a matter of discretion what a just outcome looks like from the perspective of the creditors who are entitled to have their interests protected. If we can next turn to Cardoza and see first what SIB seeks to draw from Cardoza at paragraph 38 of SIB's skeleton, tab 9 of the core bundle, page 121. One has SIB's submission that Cardoza illustrates that a solvent company may suffer a loss even where an unlawful payment is otherwise balance sheet neutral because it may alter its ability to continue its business and that an insolvent company is likely to suffer a recoverable loss in such circumstances because of the material difference which the recovery of such loss is likely to make to the distribution of assets. Now as to the first of those limbs, well, maybe so when one's concerned with the liability of a director but the duty owed by a bank under Quince Care is a duty of care in the execution of its customer's payment instructions, not a duty as the continued ability of the customer to trade. And we've already been around the houses about the fact that it's not SIB's case against HSBC that but for the alleged breaches it would have stopped trading any earlier than it did. And more than that, my lord, if you were on our facts to take the entire sum claimed against HSBC and drop it back into SIB's coffers, it would be a drop in the ocean of SIB's insolvency and there's no world in which it would have made any difference to SIB's ability to trade. 
So every way you play it, you say that first proposition has no relevance to HSBC liability. The second proposition, that an insolvent company may suffer a loss as a result of balance sheet neutral payment because of the difference in the distribution. Well, we've just looked at the cases that were relied upon in Cardoza as to how to redress the impact on distribution. They do not depend on the company having suffered a loss. And the reason for the focus on the distribution of assets relates and relates specifically to the particular duties owed by directors. It simply can't be translated from that context to ours. Cardoza, we say, is just another example of those principles being applied to defaulting directors. So with that preamble, I'm going to go to Cardoza at first, sorry, on the summary judgment application, which we have at tab 29 of the authorities bundle. My lord, the summary judgment application came before Mr. Justice Newey. That application was focused. Which page is it in the? My lord, I'm going to go to page 987 for the first reference within the judgment, but just by way of summary of what was going on. My lord, the application was focused on payments totaling 180,000 that one of the directors had received, it was said, by way of salary and repayments of the company's indebtedness in the loan account. And one sees that if one goes to paragraph 13 of page 984. One of the objections to summary judgment was that no remedy would be ordered because the effect of repayment would simply be to revive the director's claim against the company and there would be security. At paragraph 25, Mr. Justice Newey begins a survey of the cases that have considered the remedies available when a director has in breach of duty caused his company to favor a particular creditor. And he refers first to West Mercia, which we've looked at. And then at paragraph 27, he refers to his own decision in GHLM and Maru. We also have that, my lords, at tab 18 of the bundle, but we can pick up all of the salient passages here. Now, in GHLM, to summarize, the directors had acted in breach of duty when they sold stock to another company, which one of them owned. But GHLM had not gone into liquidation. So importantly, section 239 wasn't available. As one sees at paragraph 28 here, Mr. Justice Newey had there expressed the view that in such a case, the company was likely to have to show, A, that it had suffered a loss, B, that the director has profited, or C, that the transaction in question is not binding on the company. And he went on to note, as one sees further down that same quote, that the first of these may be impossible if the preference has discharged a debt such that the company's balance sheet is unaffected. Now, in the event in GHLM, Mr. Justice Newey determined the sale to be void since the purchaser was on notice of the director's breach of duty. So it was therefore, in his categories, a category 3C case. And as one sees, one goes on to paragraph 29 and the further citation from GHLM there. It was accepted in GHLM that there was no loss in terms of GHLM's balance sheet. So that knocked out category A. And Mr. Justice Newey does not suggest that that concession should not have been made. The claimant was not able to identify a profit to the Maroos, and that knocked out category B. So on that basis, Mr. Justice Newey concluded that a case had not been made out for either compensation or a profit-based award against the Maroos personally. However, on the footing that the contract was void, the purchaser had to account for the sums received that could resurrect their claim against GHLM. Mr. Justice Newey's next stop in his survey of cases was HLC, as one sees at paragraph 30, which we've looked at, and specifically the cases 
passages there about reconstituting the trust fund. And he drew from that the conclusions that one sees at paragraph 32 as to the fact that the remedies available where a director has a breach of duty caused a company to prefer a particular creditor will vary depending on whether the company is in liquidation or not, whether the preference consists in paying to the debt or not, and so forth. Now, that is all very interesting as a matter of company law, but it doesn't follow that a company being in liquidation or not has any bearing on the remedy available against a bank for breach of the Prince Care duty. That remedy is damages, and to the extent that a loss to the customer flows from the making of the payment, there will be damages. Nothing here calls into doubt the proposition that in such a case, there's no loss if the payment discharges a debt. Mr. Justice Newey goes on to refer to the common sense proposition that if money paid by a company in discharge of debt is recovered from the payee, the debt will revive, as happened in HLC and GHLM. But all of that is in the context of reversing the director's denuding of the trust fund, whilst at the same time avoiding unfairness in either direction in the distribution. The debt revives to avoid overcompensating other creditors within that distribution. None of this suggests that where a bank is liable for breach of the Prince Care duty in making a payment that discharges a debt, you need to wait to see whether the company goes into liquidation, what the statement of affairs is in the company, whether or not the payment can be recouped from the payee or the defaulting director, before you can even begin to determine whether or not there is a loss to the company for which the bank is liable. Now, in Cardoza, Mr. Justice Newey declined to give summary judgment, and the matter then came to trial before His Honour Judge Simon Barker, QC, and we have that at tab 34. And it was if we could pick it up in the head note, page 1229, paragraph H7. There was a debate about whether or not on the facts the duty to have regard to the interests of creditors was engaged. The judge resolved that by holding that the duty was engaged in circumstances where the company was on the verge of insolvency, not actually insolvent. And over the page at H9, the directors argued in relation to equitable remedies that equitable compensation should not have a penal effect on a fiduciary, that the amounts they'd waived on their loan accounts when they resigned from the club should be taken into consideration, and that NTFC, the club, had not suffered a loss because its balance sheet was unaffected. So let's turn to the body of the decision to see how that was dealt with. But to state the obvious, the whole discussion is in the context of equitable remedies for breach of duty by a director. The point is not being debated in our context. We can pick up the judgment at paragraph 157, page 1261, where we there see the argument that was being advanced for the director, and that was that where outside the statutory period under section 239, a director prefers himself to other creditors, the director is not liable to replace the money at the suit of the company because the company has suffered no loss. The judge then refers at paragraph 159 to the principle drawn from GHLM, that just as a trustee must show what he's done with trust property, so the starting point here is that the director must show the payment to him of company property was proper. Then there's reference in the next paragraph to Mr. Justice Newey's categories A, B, and C, and then at paragraph 187, if we could jump forward to page 1268, the judge refers to HLC and the passage from target holdings that we've looked at. So the judge clearly has in view the trustee-like status of the director vis-a-vis the assets of the company in what he then goes on to say at paragraph 188. Paragraph 188, foot of that page and over to the following page, he returns to GHLM and he says of Mr. Justice Newey, 
observation that it may be impossible to show a loss where the balance sheet's unaffected. I do not understand Mr. Justice New to have meant that in all cases where the balance of assets, net of liabilities, remains unchanged by reversing a preference, the company's unlikely to have suffered a loss. For example, the net assets figure may remain the same after restoration and the compensating adjustment to reinstate a liability to a director, but the distribution of assets, notional or actual, to those entitled to receive them may be very materially different. For example, the restoration of cash to an otherwise illiquid solvent balance sheet may have a significant effect on the company's ability to pay creditors and continue trading. Further, the sense in which the word loss is used may include assets which ought to but do not form part of the trust estate because they've been misapplied, for example, by disbursement without authority. The remedy available to address this loss is restoration to restore the value of the assets to the trust estate. Now, my lords, that passage is the high point of Sib's submission as to what it seeks to extract from these cases. I'll come back to it in a moment. To summarize what follows, the argument for the company was that there was a loss because money is paid to the company and intended for use in furtherance of its business objectives had been diverted by the directors for their personal benefit. It was also pointed out that some of the payments in issue had not been paid through the director's loan account or entered in the company's books, so they were not on any view balance sheet neutral. All of that is a summary of paragraphs 189 to 195. The directors in Cardoza argued that the jurisdiction to order relief against a defaulting fiduciary wasn't penal, and they argued that the court should not, as a matter of discretion, grant relief because they claimed the company's balance sheet was unaffected. They relied on the fact they'd waived claims in excess of the sums claimed from them and that some of the payments related to debts due to them for salary, and that's a summary of paragraphs 196 to 203. The judge summed up the company's submission, as one sees at paragraph 206, page 1271, as being that the appropriate remedy was restoration of the trust fund. The judge made his findings of breach of fiduciary duties, paragraph 204, the same page, and it's in that context that the judge then reversed paragraph 208 to the director's submissions by reference to GHLM. The company had not suffered a loss because its balance sheet was unaffected by the payments, and he there says, I have explained my understanding of the sense in which the word loss is to be understood. Reversing the depletion of cash assets by misapplication in the case of an illiquid company may alter the ability of the company to continue its business. In other words, the complexion of or picture of financial state of affairs painted by the balance sheet may be fundamentally different even though the net total of assets less liabilities on the balance sheet remains unchanged. And then he went on to point out, in any event, reversing the misappropriation of the sum of 2.05 million, which was never recorded in NFTC's books, would not leave NTFC's assets unchanged. So as regards one substantial element of the claim, the argument that the books were unaffected was in any event a bad one. As regards the remainder, the judge comments that he has explained his understanding of the sense in which the word loss is to be understood. Now that's a reference back to paragraph 188, and it's clear, reading the two together, and in the context of the submissions that were being made on either side, that he is giving loss a special meaning because of the particular context in which he's considering the issue. In effect, my lords, his conclusion was that it doesn't lie in the mouth of a trustee to resist a discretionary order to restore the trust fund on the ground there's no loss in the balance sheet, for instance. When restoring the trust fund to the condition it should have been in, but for the breach, may well have beneficial consequences for the company, which is what he described here. And if we follow back to paragraph 188, we say the key part of that paragraph, those last two sentences, where the judge explains the sense in which the word loss is used in this context. 
it's in that context that it's relevant that restoration may, even if it doesn't change the net figure, change the distribution or may change whether the company can continue trading. So the conclusion in that case, at paragraphs 210 to 12, was that the first defendant had to restore a sum of money to the company, but actually the second defendant did not, because his drawing on the loan account related to sums which he was properly owed and had gone through the books. He had preferred himself to breach his duty, but the company wasn't in the insolvency process. Therefore, the interest of creditors didn't intrude, and no remedy was granted. Now, my lords, we say this is a long haul for little reward in terms of relevance to this case. The fact a trustee can't expect to be given the benefit of the doubt on whether the trust restoring the trust funds will be of practical utility to the company is unsurprising. Cardoza outlined arguments as to why that might be the case, and that's good reason for granting that equitable discretionary remedy. It's very far indeed from the issue that concerns us. The case isn't an authority for the correct approach to whether a company suffered loss where it seeks to make a third party liable for breach of the duty of care. NEMGIA is the authority that is in point in that respect. My lord, I said I would circle back to the 36 million that went to Toronto Dominion before I concluded my submissions. I accept that Mr. Justice Nugent didn't address our separate point on that sum because we didn't advance it as a separate argument before him, but it is a separate argument that was relied on in our evidence in support of our application below. It's available on the pleadings. It's based on undisputed facts, and we do ask this court to address it. We say that as regards the 36 million that was simply transferred to another account of SIBs, there's an even simpler answer. Funds moved to another bank account under your own control simply cannot be said to be lost to you as a result of that move. There is in the most basic sense no loss that could be said to be resulting from the alleged Quince Care breach. SIB attempts to answer that at paragraph 69 of their skeleton, tab 9, page 133, which simply repeats really what one saw in the reply to which I've taken your lordship. We say it's no answer. Regardless of whether the transfers can be said to have been in furtherance of the Ponzi scheme, the fact is it wasn't the transfer that caused the loss of those funds. They remained available to SIB after the transfer, just as they had been before. My lords, those are my submissions on the loss appeal, unless there's anything further on which I can assist the court. Not for me. Anything from Lord Justice Moylan? No, thank you. Lord Justice Arnold? No, thank you. Mr. Penney? My lords, this is a single issue, whether if we prove our case on the Quince Care duty, we can show that we've suffered a recoverable loss in excess of the small amount paid out wrongfully to the English Cricket Board. My learned friend has complicated the issue by, with great respect to her, looking at the question from the wrong end of the telescope. The duty, which I accept is a narrow duty, and one, as my Lord's Master of the Rolls has indicated, often difficult to bring home, and it's sufficiently summarized in paragraph 87 of the judgment of the Master of the Rolls as Chancellor in Singularis. The duty is to protect the funds held in the customer's account from fraudulent disposition. The fact that vindicating that right will benefit only creditors rather than the company itself is nothing to the point. So the duty is not to pay money out of the account after the trigger for that duty has occurred. The duty was breached. The accounts were not frozen. 
And as a result, as the learned judge said in paragraph 43 of his judgment, page 143 of the core bundle, it's not suggested that there was sufficient allegation of a breach of fiduciary duty by Mr. Stanford, that he broke those duties, and that every single payment out of the $118 million in the HSBC account was paid out in breach of duty. So it's that fraudulent payment in breach of duty by Mr. Stanford, where he continued to make payments out of a massively insolvent company, so that the Ponzi scheme would not be discovered. That is the consequence of the breach of duty by HSBC. And we say that the correct way of approaching the question of damage suffered as a result of that breach of duty is to start with the loss which undoubtedly occurred. That is to say, as a result of the breach of duty, roughly $80 million, which was in the four HSBC accounts, as of the date when we say they should have frozen them, was all paid away as a result of Mr. Stanford's fraudulent breach of his fiduciary duty, so that none of it effectively remained available to SIB. The question which has to be asked and answered after that is, in common with all questions of common law damages and loss, is there a countervailing benefit, which means that at the end of the day, my client cannot prove that he has suffered a loss. So you don't start with Ms. Robertson's approach, because the balance sheet is unaffected, there is no loss. You look at the loss, which is the payment out of the $80 million, and you then consider whether there is some benefit which SIB has received, which must be brought into account. And to that I will turn after the short adjournment. But I just wanted to pick up, if I may, a couple of points which arose on the way, which may be helpful to the court. The first is the position as between the $80 million and the $118 million. $80 million was there at the beginning of August. $118 million was paid out. The court asked the question of how much was left in February when the accounts were frozen. I can tell the court it's not in these papers. It's in four accounts. There's something under $5 million was left. The rest had all gone. It follows that the $80 million had disappeared. A further $43 million or thereabouts had been paid in by other gullible investors who were able to put their money into the HSBC account because they hadn't been frozen. And all but $5 million of that additional $43 million was also paid out in fraudulent breach of trust. Now, my Lord and Master of the Royals, in discussion with Ms. Robertson, commented on the narrow scope of the claim that we made. It is entirely correct that the claim we made for breach of the Quinn's Care duty is a claim in respect of the loss of the monies which should have remained in the account but did not remain in the account. It is irrelevant to that claim as to whether, as is likely but unnecessary for my case, once HSBC shut the door, the Ponzi scheme would have collapsed, or whether, because of the 
breaches of duty and conduct of other banks, it would have limped on until Mr. Stanford was arrested. That's not important because our case is that if HSBC had not acted in breach of duty, the monies would have remained in the account and would have remained available to the company at the time of its final disclosure of the Ponzi scheme. My Lord, the Master of the Realms identified the possibility of a broader claim based on the proposition that had HSBC acted otherwise than in breach of duty, insolvency would have been evident much earlier. There is no doubt that SIB was massively insolvent throughout most of its existence and certainly by August of 2008. And that therefore, the much greater losses which occurred because of the continuing dissipation of the funds held in the account as at the 1st August would have been avoided. Tantalizing though such a much larger claim might be, the court will readily understand that such a claim would engage difficult questions as to the scope of duty, whether the duty to preserve the 40 million really gives rise within that scope of duty to prevention of losses in multiple countries from multiple other banks. And of course, would give rise to a much larger factual inquiry. We haven't made that claim, but the fact that we haven't made it does not mean that our claim as made is not a good one. And that the fact that we have made a narrow claim based on the direct consequences of the breach of the Quince Care duty should not be seen as inadequate simply because we did not make a larger but much more difficult claim. My Lord, I see the time and it may be convenient to pause at that stage. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fenwick. We'll resume at two o'clock. 